everyone. Lovely to have you here for this Lunch and Learn session. My name is Alison Bird. I am a program manager here at Climate Salad and it's wonderful to be with you today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, which of course will be different for all of us. Uh, for me, that's the Minjungle people of the Bunjalung Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. I'd also like to invite you to share in the chat um, your name, your company, and where you're tuning in from um, today. That would be great. Um, today's session Communicating Climate Impact to Investors and Corporates is in partnership with our friends at KPMG High Growth Ventures. Uh, there will certainly be an opportunity for questions, so do put any that you have in the chat as we go and we'll make sure that those get answered. I'd like to introduce Kylie Little, who I know many of you are familiar with. Kylie is the Director of the Climate Tech Team at KPMG High Growth Ventures. And Kylie, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Alison. Um, we weren't sure if we would have a, a lot of no-shows in this week leading up to Climate Week as everyone rushes off to New York. So exciting to see lots of people jumping in. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with um, High Growth Ventures, um, I feel like the names are getting familiar, so everyone probably is, but just in case. We're a team within KPMG that works with founders to build sustainable, scalable startups. We've developed a range of services specifically designed and priced for founders starting from pre-Series A and onwards. My role here is really focused in on climate, the climate tech sector and really understanding what are the different needs, how can we help you guys that might be different to others across this sector, across the wider ecosystem. Um, so to jump in for today, today we're going to be talking about communicating climate impact to investors and corporations. Um, we know that understanding and quantifying climate impact, both for investors, investors and customers in a tangible way can be very challenging, um, particularly given that a lot of climate techs are solving problems that are 10, 20 or even 100 years into the future. We know from the recent climate salad survey as well that 66% of respondents indicated they're unable to quantify their climate impact and 18% do not have an impact measurement framework. So we can see that it's really challenging for everyone. So to explore this further today, we've called on the expertise of um, one of our fabulous portfolio companies, um, Geordie Kay from Great Rap, who's been grappling with this exact challenge for some time now. And Josh Geelan, who lead, who's our lead partner for ESG and KPMG's enterprise team. So Josh brings some unique perspective in, in that he works across ESG and CFO advisory with both founders and investors. So he's got a kind of nice lens to add to Geordie's founder view. So welcome to you both. Um, Geordie, I'll, I'll start with you first. It'd be good to get a quick rundown from you on Great Rap and, and what you guys do. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so my name's Jordi. I'm the um, co-CEO um, uh, with with my wife, Julia. Um, we manufacture compostable stretch wrap. Um, currently, um, we um, use uh, starch from tapioca and potato waste. Um, we're transitioning to a carbon capture system um, in the next few years that will um, have our material made from 100% um, CO2 emissions. Um, we have a uh, 10,000 square meter factory um, in Tullamarine where I currently am and I realize I've probably got a whole bunch of our IP right here on the whiteboard if you want to figure out our formula. Zoom in, zoom in. <laughs> I think it's a die head design but uh, go for it. But um, yeah, so we, we have a um, 10,000 square meter factory um, that um, for any manufacturing bus that used to be the Willow factory, the old blue and white eskies. Um, sadly, they went under in 2007 and now we, we operate out of this big, beautiful space. Um, we have a team of 25 people um, uh, and sell across Australia to a lot of big FMCGs, um, you know, obviously working closely with Woolworths because they're one of our major investors um, and then uh, sort of expanding to the US, working with a major retailer there at the moment as well. Um, and I'll probably hand it over to Josh. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. Thanks, Jordy. Um, so a few familiar faces on the call today. So great to see you all again. Um, that, for those that haven't heard me before, so my name is obviously Josh. I'm a partner with KPMG. I've got two roles. Um, so as Kylie said, I'm the lead partner for ESG in our mid-market practice, which means I work with high-growth ventures, venture capital funds, private equity funds, and family offices uh, predominantly. Um, and then I'm also a CFO too, basically the same. So I work with a whole bunch of high-growth venture clients and then some family offices and, and businesses around them. Um, prior to coming to KPMG, though, I don't have a typical, uh, maybe big four partner background, you could say. Um, so I've been a founder myself three times, both in the US and here. 
um, and also used to be a CFO for a leading fintech in Sydney. Um, so, yeah, certainly bring a broad perspective and uh, look forward to today's discussion. Good, thanks both. Um, so um, I'll start with you, Josh, because it's interesting a year ago, I'd say that we were having lots and lots of conversations in market with everyone sort of desperately trying to work out how do I do ESG reporting at really early stage and what does that need to look like? And we had founders looking for this. We had VCs looking for very much that ESG reporting piece almost as a standalone, as kind of like, how do I do this thing that conveys my impact? Um, and that feels like it's shifted a little bit, like it's shifted in, in, in some ways for us over the past 12 months. It'd be great to get some insight from you of like, one, what are the drivers behind this sort of massive push around that space? And then how you're seeing that that sort of changing at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think about a year ago, we saw this real rush towards um, the VCs and PE outfits really wanted to update their ESG mandates. And what like when we started working with them and looking beyond, well, you know, why do you want to do this? What it came down to was where does their capital come from? And whether it's institutional or family office, what we we're finding was, you know, Australian super, super, ethical super, some of these really big institutional providers of capital to the VCs were basically saying, you won't get our money. Like you literally won't get our money unless you can prove minimum standards around what you're investing in and the impact that creates. And so that created, I guess, two lots of opportunities within the VC world where they were saying, well, hang on, just to get access to, to annex capital raise at the VC, we need to be eligible you know, for the main institutional providers. But also, can we create a new fund? Can we create an impact fund or product and then go out there and actually raise capital to do that as well? And of course, several iterations of that are now in market. But the other big thing that's really kicked off, so that's, that's really happened and been happening already. So we've worked with VCs and PEs most of them, I would say, have now got screens of some sort. You, you might not see them. Some are quite actually overt. Um, but the big change we're seeing now is really family office. And they don't think about it as ESG, but they do think about it as impact. And they certainly think about it as family values and purpose and how they create that legacy of what they want to invest in. So that that is the last, I guess, trend that we're seeing. Um, but ultimately, I think what it comes down to, Kylie, is most of our climate tech founders um, – they would all say that the world's a better place because they're part of it and they're really creating novel novel solutions to what's, you know, quite a serious crisis that we're facing. What we do find from the investor focus is they will say, look, founders come to us and say, we are saving the world, you should give us money. And what the investors will say is, look, we are actually an investor still, even though we care about impact or care about ESG, we're still investing, we're not donating. So we're not, we're not a charity, charities create impact as well. And so it, it's got to this point where what we really need to say is what is that stage appropriate way that we can showcase, yes, we're making a difference, yes, the world needs us, but also we're a great business and we're a great investment. Invest in us because of that, staple the impact to it, and let's grow together and achieve both of those things concurrently. And certainly that's where we're seeing the, the, the traction in market at the moment. Yeah, great. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, I feel like every founder I talk to, you know, if you sort of ask their purpose, their, their purpose, like they, they want to save the world. They're, they're more focused than anyone on getting this right. So the, the idea of sort of building reporting to keep them honest, it's not about keeping them honest. It's about sharing sharing the information. But there's this real understanding of, of that absolute drive to do good in the world. Um, and and that, that leads straight to you, Geordie, because what you guys are doing is absolutely amazing. And you've obviously been grappling this for a while in terms of how do you do that sort of the ESG reporting and impact reporting at different stages? That's probably interesting to understand for people on the call. I guess, what does that look like at different stages from early through to now? And, and, and what are you seeing play out in market? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like, so for us, um, we were really fortunate in the in our, the early stages. Um, we had someone in a finance function that actually built out um, the impact team and really put in place, what are those impact metrics for the company? What do we want to do? Like, how can we capture water off the factory and recycle it in some sort of way, shape, or form? How do we roll out solar? How do we have all of our material get composted? Um, and so we kind of built it in from day one, which was great. And then we started bringing on more, I guess, maybe mature institutional investors who started asking, what's our framework? And, um, and you know, what's your reporting cadence? And here's our framework. Can you sort of slot um, into that? Um, we definitely found that the sort of earlier stages when we're sort of pre-seed and seed, um, when we were raising in 2020 um, wasn't wasn't really a sort of a discussion point. And, and I don't know if it's because we've grown as a company and we're sort of post Series A or if it's the times of change. 
but it's a really big um, thing for for um, a lot of our sort of more mature yeah institutional investors who are sort of asking um, sort of for those sort of frameworks. I guess the way we've sort of um, gone about it though is. Um, I guess it's always a bit of a debate with each of those investors because they're like, yeah, cool. That's an interesting reporting framework, but like it doesn't work for us. Like it do- there's no point in tracking that. Like we're here to do what we want to do and we're really focused on, on that. And, and we're just, we want to absolutely um, nail that job. So here's how we're tracking it. And so we've kind of had to go back to investors and sort of make it work. Um, so I'm sure they've probably done that with all of their portfolio companies. Um, and then they figure out how to then report that back to their sort of LPs. But I think, you know, things that we're sort of now focused on in our impact reporting is like, um, you know, um, where are we most exposed? So I think, you know, with your financial reporting, um, obviously you sort of look at, yeah, financially where you're most exposed and then for, from an impact side. So we're really exposed in in composting. It's really, like we can produce all of this fantastic product, but it's critical it gets composted and returned to soil. So how do we track those metrics and, and sort of show that to investors? And and so, yeah, I guess the way we look at impact yeah, reporting is is where are those exposure points and, and how do we track them and improve them? And, and do you find the investors actually, they are open to taking your lead in terms of you saying these are our drivers or are there, are there things that they're mandating with you in terms of what, what they want to see? I think to Josh's point, a lot of people have no idea that, <laughs> you know, like, um, they're kind of like, well, I don't know, you tell me. And so yeah. um, I well, think, that's handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people are happy to, they just want to see something that they can show yeah. to someone above them and I think yeah. um so you know it's important that it's honest and truthful and has yeah. conviction behind it um that you're not spinning out some data that um is meaningless so um but I definitely think people are happy to take your lead as long as it yeah means something to you and your company yeah awesome um and, and Josh are there, are there particular frameworks or approaches that you would say that you've seen have been used effectively and and and, and also cross stages because the, the challenge we do see is that you've got someone early stage saying and they asked for this reporting or these frameworks and like how how much do I do at an early stage when you're really sort of trying to get that business off the ground versus that series A, series B stage? Yeah, look, it's a really tricky one to get right. So in terms of frameworks, there are four or 500 different reporting frameworks out there at the moment that you could be using. Now, if you're a listed company, nearly 100% of listed companies, like it's 90 something percent of listed companies already report on one or multiple ESG frameworks. Mm-hmm which is good for them, hopefully, but it's not going to be good for a startup. And so it comes down to me, what's the why? Like why, why are we even doing this, right? So the three main propositions that usually can make sense to a startup include one, access to talent. So particularly in a tight labour market and where you rely on younger or more diverse labour, ESG and impact is really important to them. And you want to attract the best staff, retain the best staff, make them feel like they're part of that, making a difference in the world. And if you can do that real authentically, that's quite powerful. So that's number one. Number two is access to capital, which is VCs, family offices. The question there is which framework are they using, if any? To enter Geordie's point, sometimes they're like, oh, I don't know, just give us something nice we can then give to our you know, ultimate investors, right? Which might come down to which framework are they using? So think about where are you trying to get your capital from? Because if it's a VC, look through them to think about where is their money coming from? What do those investors think about? Because if that's Australian super, you can actually go and look it up and see exactly what they care about because you know that's what they're going to talk to the VC about. You can also ask your VC for the ESG screen if they have one. So about half of them do, give or take. So you can ask in advance around, okay, we've got a series A coming up. We want to make sure we're on a, you know, a positive foot. Ask for the screen and, and do it in, in like an internal self-assessment early on and find out what it looks like. Now, if you're attracting or want to attract family office, don't even call it ESG. Think about their family values and purpose, what the family stands for, and what impact the family wants to create, if any. That's what they'll care about. They'll care much less about a formalised framework and much more about just telling about how you're going to change the world and whether we align to that from a values perspective, which is much more around what Geordie said before. And the final value proposition is really around uh, access to customers. So, for example, Woolworths, Coles, European markets, American markets now as well, like those major customers, and we're seeing come through procurement panels, particularly on government and, and T1 customers, are really driving a lot of downstream behaviour. What is also a game changer in that space is the upcoming RWSB 
or International Sustainability Standards Board. That disclosure framework is becoming mandatory one January next year for listed companies. Now it's also coming in mandatory behind it for private companies and as in large reporting private companies. We don't know when that is, but it's coming, but it's also up and downstream. So basically if, if one of those bigger entities is your customer or target customer, they will have to be asking you shortly how you perform. So you get, we've got a bit of a compliance push happening there with a set framework, which we know what it looks like. The opportunity for our climate techs is really thinking about, well, how do we disrupt that? Because a lot of climate techs are there to disrupt legacy players. So if you can look at those customers and go, well, I know they've got a mandate. I know what their framework is. I know they've got a real problem coming up with the IWSB or the TCFD. How can I practically solve that problem for them and disrupt and dislodge one of my competitors or you know more traditional competitors? So we're seeing a lot of advantageous strategic behaviour in that sense as well around well, how do we use this to our advantage versus seeing it as a, as a compliance activity. So the answer to your question, Kai, it really comes down to what's in it for us as, as a startup and when is the appropriate time? Certainly, if you're going to do an IPO, you've got to be all over it. But if you're still proof of concept, I wouldn't worry about that much. I'll do exactly what Jordy said and think about, I'll just ask yourself the question, is the world a better place because we're part of it? Are we part of the solution to this climate challenge? If you can say yes, genuinely, just think about how you create a narrative around that and keep it really authentic. That's all you need to do. And then work towards pre-exit, being all over this from a compliance perspective and having all the frameworks in place. And think about a logical, practical journey to get you down that pathway. Yeah, amazing. Is there anything you'd add to that, Geordie, or? Yeah. Um, no, I think, like, I think that was um, perfectly summarised. We probably just finished the call there. That was, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> okay, done. No, <laughs> um, no that, that was, like, honestly fantastic. I do, like, I think just to add to, yeah, Josh's point around, like, these companies, um, like, we're definitely, we look for companies that have got targets um, and we go, well, because we're like a like for like um, sort of product. Um, you know, you use this pallet wrap now to use ours. It costs the same, but it's ten percent or you know, hundred percent better than the little planet. Um, and so, um, so that's sort of I think a definitely a critical part um, of our sales sort of strategy. But also, like twenty percent of um, Wall Street listed companies um, in the US have either plastic or climate targets. Um, mm. And so, there is just so much opportunity out there. And very little innovation that actually solves the problems that they're sort of um, looking for at the moment. There's a lot of like pre-revenue or early sort of stage companies that are solving those problems, but like actually tangible right now, um, there's very few companies out there that, that can solve those um, problems for those companies. And, and a lot of them are like 2025 targets. So they've got, you know, 18 months to solve these massive problems that they're not going to hit. So um, it, it is a really sort of exciting time um, to be a company that's sort of solving those problems for these folks. Um, and I think definitely what we are seeing though is um, you have a sort of large company that's got the targets, um, but then it's still made up of these individual humans um, that um, uh, are trying to be sort of instrumental um, within that company. So it's still a very personal thing um, and you've got these folks that are really trying to sort of drive change within the company and then bring it to the exec team. So, yeah, we've we've found a lot of success in that. And it's it's been really fantastic to see, you know, I think I remember like 10, five years ago, whatever it was, like you just started to see all of these targets being set by these massive companies. And you're like, yeah, whatever, this is a bit wishy-washy. Uh, and then to actually sort of experience it and you go, oh, wow, this is actually materialising into something fantastic. It's, it's super cool. It's so exciting because it's like, you know, you can be a, climate denier all you like but there's a target to be hit now so <laughs> you've got to do it um and and that's interesting because you're talking about the narrative before josh and you know i think again one of the things we've seen come through is that that sense of you know if your narrative is all about how you're going to save the world and solve for climate the other side of that we're seeing is articulating the commercial proposition and that's one of the big challenges now is how do you bring those two sort of stories together and and make that attractive to investors um, interesting sort of to understand from you, Geordie, how, how challenging has it been to articulate that, I guess, that commercial proposition, given the amount of work, the amount of risk, the amount it's taken to sort of for you guys to get to this point? I mean, it's obviously a lot of investment. It's been, it's been a huge effort. Um, you know, how, how have you approached that? What, what's that look like for you? Yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. So I think like in Australia, 
um, we're really cautious as a market um, of greenwashing. Um, so I think like when we go to companies and we talk about our products, like they want to see all of the data. They want to see everything because if they're going to announce that we're switching to great wrap, um, you know, they are potentially going to get like crucified in the media or going to be really celebrated. And, 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 mm. um, and so that's, yeah, really interesting sort of thing. I think when we go to the U S market, it's completely different. They're just like super gun ho like, Oh yeah, it's, it works. All right. Great. Let, let's just like roll this out as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, I think it's been really critical that we, sort of talk about uh, like our, our sort of impact frameworks and what we're doing and that reporting because that that composting piece and that mm. those targets that we've set and as a part of that impact in, um, reporting is has been absolutely um, like super critical for these companies in Australia so um, yeah we've definitely sort of seen how that sort of flowed through and and been really positive for, for sales. And, and how much scrutiny in, in that process or how much focus has there been on the commercial proposition itself like as you, as you've grown? Um, yeah, I think so. I'm just um, moving into a room because the yeah, office okay. has just got quite busy and loud. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've definitely seen sort of that, um, I guess, um, sort of scrutiny. I like, I don't know though, like, like people generally like want to do good. They want to be good people and they want to make good decisions that improves their company. Um, so like if, as long as it's better than the, the current status quo, then they're, they're super excited about it. Um, but unfortunately, like it still does come down to like price. Um, so like mm. you can have this fantastic, and when we started our price was twice the price mm. of the, you know, the norm. And we're now like a five to 10% premium. Um, but when we sort of started, it was just like um, rejected from so many folks that were like, oh, we love this. And then it gets the price negotiations, it completely falls over. Um, so it, like at the end of the day, I think like, the ultimate scrutiny still just comes down to like how much does it cost yeah interesting and 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 josh you know any any thoughts from you just on that that i guess that that the commercial and the marrying of the commercial and impact sort of approach in terms of that narrative because that feels like something that we're seeing a lot more of that that need to bring the two together yeah we've seen a few of our clients really get that basically if you think about stakeholder capitalism and it's that concurrent prioritization of people planet prosperity so like, exactly to Jordy's point, if, if people, and I think most people in this space do want to be good citizens, they do want to make a difference, and we're part of that generational change around, look, we want to, we want to actually change the world. So what's what's fascinating, I ran two masterclasses in Melbourne and Sydney uh, late last year for family offices. We had 31 offices attend across those two sessions. And when we asked them, what is the greatest opportunity out there for you from an investment perspective right now? I kid you not, about 30 or 29 of them said climate change mm. and climate tech because I love the scalability of tech, right? So, okay, great. And, and why? And that is sort of the best investment opportunity of a lifetime since the dot-com boom. The greatest challenge was actually, one, finding founders because a lot of these family offices are, are as you guys know, private, live under a rock, hard to come by, don't want to be found even. Um, but they I hope they're not to. on this call. I hope they're not as cool. Don't, don't <laughs> count me out on this. Um, I mean, it's the nicest possible way to be on the call. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so how, how, do we, how do we get those two to come together? So, to me, that's actually the greatest challenge we've got. We've got family officers and particularly younger generations of those family officers coming through next gen saying, we want to invest in this. Because if you think about a family office, think about their private ancillary fund or their, or their PATH and the fact they have a family giving program. They are passionate about um, giving money away and creating an impact and, and furthering their legacy but if they can flip that conversation and actually invest and make an impact, that's really attractive to them because instead of giving away their capital, they're actually increasing their capital and potentially also magnifying their impact as well at the same time. So it's not that they're giving away their, their giving programs, but they're certainly very, very interested in impact investment. So that is very much changing that conversation for them. Mm. Around how do we do this? How do we get access? What does that look like, and and how to and how to reframe that up? And, and and so what? So for the founders that you're seeing, or like what you're seeing in market, what 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 do you like? How should founders be thinking about this when they're approaching investors? You know, as opposed to the sort of here's my ESG report and here's my model, or like how 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 should founders be approaching this in terms of really getting that focus back into the commercial proposition? 
Yeah, and so the, the bit of missed before, Carly. Yeah. Um, so with that stakeholder capitalism component around, well, how do we approach that? What we've seen some of us do really well is, well, hang on, how do we showcase to these investors who we know are really keen on this, how are we going to build a great business? Like invest in me as a founder because you believe in me, my IP or our IP, and also the plan about where we're going with it. Mm. Like that, that's, that's the obvious. All you guys know that around, okay, you're like, you know, well, most of you out there raising money. What you need to think about doing is how do we create impact in a really meaningful way and how do we staple those two together? So you can show, look, if we take on this 2 mil or 10 mil, 100 mil or whatever it is and we triple our business, are we going to triple or quadruple the impact we create? Because if we can staple those two things together, you can go to those offices and the VCs and say, hey, we are a great investment. We've got the team to do this. We've got a great piece of novel technology. We're going to make this work. And check out the impact we create at the same time. If this flies, we create this amazing impact. And by the way, it's actually mapped to your impact framework and your investors' impact framework as well. Take the hard work out of it for them. That is getting a lot of traction in market. So we're seeing some really great examples come through where they're basically going, here's our financial model, here's the impact model, here's how they come together on a really concurrent stakeholder capitalism sort of approach. Let's get it down the um, runway and make it fly. Okay, amazing. Um... So, so I guess I guess thinking about um, um, those investor interactions, um, I guess for you, Jordy, are you seeing are you being asked for? I think we touched on this before, but are you being asked for specific reporting from different investors? Like, are you having to provide different reporting to multiple investors on a regular cycle, or what? What does that actually look like? Yeah, so we've got uh, on our cap table about 20, 20 investors. Mm -hmm. um, I, 13, 14, um, sort of traditional kind of VCs um, and some family offices. Um, and so um, of those 13, I think four, we have quarterly reporting cadence on impact metrics. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, but like I said, we kind of track those in, in, you know, impact metrics as well and we update them monthly in our investor updates. Um, and that is really well received by those mm -hmm. folks that don't have those sort of frameworks, but they just like, seeing that and tracking that and it and it is definitely um really really beneficial um the conversation definitely comes up as well when we're pitching for, for funding um that uh yeah a lot of people are asking what is our impact metric um you know reporting to the cadence and framework um so yeah it's definitely definitely a discussion it's it's definitely um sort of regularly um yeah gone through that sort of process with these folks as well and, and how much effort does that take you guys internally to, to I guess, produce that, maintain that, to actually provide that information? Yeah, I mean, um, it's definitely a pain. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it's like you got a million things to do and you're yeah. like, oh, I, can't, I don't have the time to, like, figure out how much we produce this much versus how much was composted yeah. down at Geelong City Council and Brisbane yeah. City You know, like, yeah. you just got, like, way, way more sort of um, other things on your plate. But um the team like as a team like everyone there's buying because everyone's like yeah. this is the reason why they came to yeah. great rap and and why we could attract great great team members is because yeah. of the impact so actually reporting on team, that um you know people love doing it and so i've i've sort of been able to go, like i used to do it with, with julia and and uh, like i said it was like really frustrating because you're trying to prioritize but um now that it's sort of managed by everyone else on the team um, yeah, it's been you love fantastic. It. Someone else is doing yeah. it. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, it must, and it must be so satisfying for you guys actually seeing, like, seeing that output. Like, it's it's exciting. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like, even just like measuring the meters we made each month, and you're like, oh wow, we did like, you know, Melbourne to Cairo in in meters produced yeah. this. But like, that's so yeah, cool, well. you know. Um, yeah. And so those sort of metrics are just like, yeah, you're really proud of. It's it's an awesome sort of thing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and and I guess for you, Josh, um, have you have you got examples of companies that you've seen or you've worked with? Um, like, what have you seen in this space in terms of um, how companies are communicating well to investors, or how they they've got sort of good smart processes or frameworks or, or or ways to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, and for those of you who heard me say this before, apologies. I know there's a few on the call. Um, you want to flip the table, so you don't really want to go and sell necessarily. Like, what you want to create is such like create the watering holes and create such a pull factor that you get investors coming to you saying, look, we love what you do. 
we want in. Um, and that, that can be quite hard to achieve. But if you look at it in market, I think, you know, I, I don't think Raj is in the call, but Raj from Bagri, Raj Bagri from Capture, sorry, uh, Zylo Systems. There are some really great examples in the climate tech space who, who create that demand pull into them because they're so good at creating that narrative around what they do. Obviously, Geordie. Um, but it really comes down to building that brand. Like you want to get visibility in all those watering holes and have a consistent message. We are here to do this. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to create that impact. Here's the impact it creates. Be seen, be consistent. Those investors will come to you and therefore that puts you in, in the most powerful position you can as a founder around evaluation and dilution. So very, very hard to achieve, but always think of that as a narrative rather than going and trying to pitch, hey, we're going to save the world. Here it is. Mm. Do try and flip it. Yes, that's important. Yes, we always have to do that. But really, really get strategic about who is my investor, which water and holes are they frequent. So if you think about family offices as this mythical creature once again, most of my offices, most of the ones I work with that aren't clients, will monitor all of those common water and holes. They'll be here in climate salad. Sometimes they are on the call. They'll be at Starbucks. They are in here. They're, being in the kitchen, right? they're not <laughs> under a rock today. Um, <laughs> they're going to they're monitor all these places. And so if you can be in front of them, they will see you and they will eventually reach out to you as well. But you've got to remember, for them, the biggest challenge is finding you. They want access to the best founders with the best ideas, creating the best impact as early as possible in most cases because it's cheaper, although some are later stage. Um, that's what they want. And so you're actually solving that problem for them than being really strategic. So that's probably the one takeaway for me. Be there, be visible, be consistent, build that brand and narrative. So your brand, your IP, your impact, and then bring that together. Okay. And, and you know, to Geordie's point, it's really satisfying to have once you've got that, that reporting in place and you can actually track that internally yourselves. It's great for the company because these are generally, you are companies that are filled with people that want to bring about change. So it's exciting to see that. But Josh, what... I guess the other side of the coin is what have you seen the impact is on, you know, on valuations or on um, acquisition or what, what mm. how, how, do you, how does that impact play out in terms of good reporting, um, having, you know, good metrics and clear, clear reporting frameworks? It is, it is still quite polarising, to, to be perfectly honest. So if you think about the uh, ESG and responsible investment landscape in Australia, about, and I haven't read the latest report just yet, so apologies, but about 50% of Australia's professionally managed capital is covered by ESG screens of some sort. Now, that itself is on this massive continuum, but it also means that 50% isn't, and therefore our vote funds, some of those will come on board because, you know, it's up from 19% two or three years ago. Some just don't get. Uh, and I did say a comment there in the chat around that, that same question. So the reality is some investors simply won't care. It's all about the profit. There's also a, a cohort of investors who, and companies. So, for example, if I if I'm an investor, and I've got, I don't know, a company X which is doing bad things, and I go, I'm going to get rid of it. It doesn't agree with my values. If someone else buys it, say it's making a lot of money, someone else will buy it. I look really good, but the world's in a better place because it still exists. And yes, I might be to argue that I've restricted capital to a degree. And certainly there are players and activist ESG investors out there doing exactly that. But there's always someone out there who's a value buyer and will buy that because it's got a strong cash flow. And so it, it is really problematic on that side of the fence. But on the other 50% of the, 50% of the fence, absolutely. So we've never seen more ESG deal flow and transaction work in history, really. So you think about the VCs and the PEs, most of them have screens. Big four banks now have screens. You've got APRA saying to insurers and saying to banks, you must start looking at this because climate risk equals financial risk. The chairman of the SEC in the US said exactly the same thing. Climate risk equals financial risk, therefore equals directors' obligations and potentially criminal charges. So we're seeing a lot more of this come through. What that is starting to translate into is, hang on, what does it mean from a valuation perspective? If, if you're a bank, for example, and you, and you look at your, your portfolio, how do, you, how do you value and how do you reward high risk and low risk in that portfolio? If I'm valuing Geordie's company, how do I value that? Do I put an ESG risk-adjusted premium or penalty on that DCF valuation, for example, to go, hang on, he's creating a positive impact. That creates a higher value. Likewise, if you've got a negative industry, you're going to put an ESG risk-adjusted charge effectively and, and downgrade that rating. That is already happening. 
on that side of the fence. Now, at the moment, is that very polarising thing? And certainly to that comment I saw in the chat, yes, there's a lot happening in the US, which goes down political divides with the state pension funds. Um, they have some massive funds there as well. But also what you see in the US is, is quite clever with what Biden did around the US Inflation Reduction Act, which is effectively dumping a whole lot of money into the sector to go, let's get this moving. But it's positioned as inflation reduction. Because a lot of people think, oh, we're going to go green, climate tech, oh, that's all nice, but it, mm. you know, in a high cost of living environment, that doesn't make sense. Well, it does. It does, and it needs to make sense. And so I thought that was quite a clever thing they did. So to answer your question, yes, we're seeing it. Yes, it's coming, and there's a whole lot more coming in that space as well. Um, so what I would always try and do, if you're on the good side of that conversation, which most of our climate techs are, think about how you showcase that and how you solve the problems for those who have those negative impacts and therefore could get lower value weight as well. I hope, hope that makes sense. I'm grabbing on a bit there. Um, yeah, and, and the IRA is really interesting because it is driving consumer behaviour. Like it's, 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 it's like the targets. It's kind of this interesting thing that you can believe whatever you believe in terms of climate, but if you're going to put money in people's pockets, it starts changing behaviour and drawing investment into innovation, which is exciting. So we need a bit more of that here. Um, so there is a question for you, Josh. Do you have a neat little list of family offices you can recommend? But I think to your point, <laughs> I've been, I think I've to your point, yes, but you're not yeah, getting it. The, the answer is the watering holes. Be in the watering holes. <laughs> yeah, look, they are notoriously private. Um, like for those of you who follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that we do a lot with our founders who like visibility. You'll yeah. never see a family office there ever. Yeah. Like they don't like visibility. Yeah. So the, the challenge for, for all you on this call is they are very, very private. And exactly what you said, Kyle, the only way to get in front of them, apart from the obvious ones like Albert's you know, and the Maya family are a bit more visible, uh, be in the watering holes, be seen, and be very A-grade, very credible. Uh, they will notice, they'll come to you. And, and, and so now I'm just going to switch back a little bit to like like specific tools. Um, I, I kind of thought people might have thrown some questions in about this, but and, and maybe it's one that people have actually worked out their sort of smart way of handling this anyway. But are there specific tools that you would have used early on or, or software or something that you found valuable, Geordie, um, as you've evolved your reporting frameworks or have you customised what you're doing? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely customised it. Um, I haven't. I haven't searched high and low for um for different tools. Like um we still do it in a spreadsheet. Um when people have frameworks and send them to us, it's still in a spreadsheet. Um maybe there's a market opportunity there, I don't know. Um but yeah, I definitely think um, you know, some of the best thing problems can be solved in a good old fashioned spreadsheet and yeah. and and like um and you know um reporting frameworks. Yeah, I, like it, it's just it's like I think keeping it as easy as possible for yourself. Um, yeah, is the best way to do it. So rather than like us working with their frameworks recording spreadsheets, um, we have ours and just say, you know, here it is each quarter. Bar, bar a couple um, that like are very, very, very strict um, with it. Um, mm -hmm. Like Giant Leap is one of our investors and they're really strict with their impact reporting and because they want to sort of track the same metrics across um, all their companies and then take that to their LPs because they're investors are invested yeah. in them because they're an impact fund. And so it, that's sort of super critical um, for them. And so, yeah, I, but again, it's still still in a Google Drive spreadsheet. Um, and so I, I, I definitely think that's just like the easiest way to sort of set it up, but make sure again, um, just to highlight, like make sure it works for you. And it's, it's something that motivates you and motivates your team because um, you're going to spend a lot of time on it. So you want to be motivated to do it. Yeah, great. Um, and is there anything you've seen in that space, Josh, or that you're aware of that, that's useful or valuable? Just <clears throat> two things on that. Protect so firstly, what, one of the best examples I've seen is, um, is actually a Google Sheet on someone's website. There's no glossy okay. ESG report. There's nothing at all. It's literally like a Google Docs on their website. And just they call it a sustainability tracker. It's honestly 10 things they're doing. Who in the company is, is responsible for it, like first name basis, where it's at, what's and all, where it's at, what's not working, what's happening next. No jargon, no lingo, just really simple to go, oh, cool, I can see what they're doing. That makes sense, right? Mm. If you get a 100-page glossy report, I don't know about you, but I don't have time or even care sometimes to actually go through and read it every single page. Mm. And if you think about, say, the, the wine sector where this example comes from, if, you, if you're down at Dan Murphy's, 
what's more compelling? Do you even care at all when you go and buy a bottle of wine or beer or whatever you buy, if, if anything? Are you going to go and read that 100-page report before you make a decision? Probably not. Doesn't make a decision on Dan Murphy's level? Yes. But as a consumer, often that pull through is hard. So to Jordy's point, simple, authentic, mm. if you're chasing customers and values alignment, ask them what they care about and, and, and link it to that. It's not good if they say, we care about this, and you're like, yeah, cool, and we're doing this thing over here. You're not going to get that pull through. So that's step one. Step two, there are some really great tools out there within the climate um, tech community to actually help you do this. So you know, like you mentioned Giant Leap before, Geordie, so one of your stable mates is, is Trace, Trace Carbon. Mm. It's a whole bunch of them. Climate Salad is this watering hole of great tools that are simple and cost-effective to help startups do this and do it well as well. So where you can support others in your community, use those tools uh, where, that, where that makes sense. So I encourage all of you to have a look and see what's out there and, uh, and support each other to you know, achieve all your goals. Yeah, awesome. Um, and so switching to like like sort of working with customers and suppliers, like and I guess you know the, the you know investors are one thing, but then actually when you start getting into sort of the customer space, Jordy, what's your experience there in terms of, of of how you work with those customers, what their expectations are from you in terms of reporting and understanding, you know what are your core metrics? How much do they need? Is it very different to investors, or is it is it kind of similar? Is it the same information that you're really sharing with them as well? Yeah, I would I would say it's um it's more of a one off rather than reporting. So like mm. here's what we've done, here's you know, here's mm. the glossy report. Um yeah. But, but yeah, it's definitely not not a hundred pages, that's for sure. Like it's it's more like three pages and it's you know, and here's our certifications and here's um, um all the data and um that that that's really important. That that product catalogue we have is um our greatest sort of sales asset because you can say pitch this fantastic thing because I think like you know I, like probably a lot of folks on this call like your, your company is probably highly technical and a lot of folks mm. you know might not understand exactly what you're doing or how it's made and um and so yeah I think it's just really critical to kind of have that um background sort of data and and, and metrics to sort of prove that what you're doing is actually legitimate and and it is good for the planet um mm. so yeah I think it, it is it is really important um for sales. For some of our really big customers, though, it's definitely that next level of um, kind of quarterly reporting on, um, like I said, how much is being composted. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's that's really like the biggest one for us and those large customers is um, if we're going to go circular, we want it to actually be circular. Um, so mm. that's that's super critical. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Josh, have you, have you seen anything with, with I know you've worked with clients who've sort of gone looking for innovative solutions. Have you seen anything from that, that sort of end customer end in terms of what they need to see or what they're looking for from, I guess, from innovators to actually say, you are going to fit the need that I have. You know, I'm trying to meet this target and to meet that target, I need these companies to show me certain metrics. Have you, have you seen any of that play out? Yeah, <clears throat> on two sides, actually. So um, I was in Sydney the other week and met with a, a client, so not a client, um, and um, they have a really novel solution for bottling industry. And so they're using that to practically go to those companies in the food and beverage and go, look, we know you've got this problem. We know 75% of your carbon footprint comes from glass bottles, for example, and the logistics and the weight and you know, they're very inefficient. We can solve that and at a lower price point suddenly they're interested on both fronts because they know they've got that reporting pain and obviously essentially taught price everyone's can anyway. So they're using that from that strategic perspective. But at the same time, those same companies are going to the market and saying, we've got this problem, we need to solve it, and they're superimposing that reporting downstream through their supply chains. And so where we see clients stuck in those supply chains with legacy businesses, they're reaching out to us and others and saying, please help, we've got this business, a bit like Kodak, we haven't changed, we're here, we're stuck. They're asking us what our carbon footprint is. One, what is carbon? Two, how, to, like, how on earth do we do this? Mm -hmm. And they're really late to the party. So that's happening at the same time that you've got, you know, everyone in this room going to the going to that customer saying, hey, we can solve this problem and save you money and do it so much better. And so those legacy businesses are in a world of pain and really open to disruption where that's happening. So that's that's what we're seeing happening on both sides of that equation, really. Okay, interesting. 
Um, so, like that's that's kind of the end of our um, the questions we were all going to run through. I guess I guess um, if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to jump in or put up your hand and and ask to ask to Geordie and Josh. But I guess as as you know, are there any sort of wrap up points from you guys in terms of other things that you would want to highlight for I guess the people on the call in terms of how you're communicating the smart ways to communicate impact and get that message across really clearly and cleanly um, to investors or customers. Yeah, I, look, I think for us, um, like we like live and breathe like our values and our purpose as, as a company, right? Like mm -hmm. I was not interested in the high growth space. I used to be a winemaker. I had a little vineyard, I farmed organically. I built a tiny house in the forest. I was so happy, but <laughs> I was really pissed off um, about using pallet wrap. And then I became obsessed with this problem and I was obsessed with like plastic waste and obsessed with the climate crisis. And um, I just wanted to solve it because I felt like I could farm organically on my little beautiful plot of, plot of land. What's the point in farming organically if the blocks around it are burning down? So that was kind of what I guess got me motivated and and out there. And, and Julia was the same as an architect designing low carbon embodied buildings. It was um, just didn't feel like she was sort of doing enough. So we, you know, created this company and and we just like live and breathe um sort of what we do and um investors and customers are incredibly intelligent people that's why they got to their sort of positions of certain sort of levels of power and um they can see through it like immediately um and so like you and you know like it's it's really hard taxing work um running a company um and you work massive hours and you need to sort of live and breathe it and you need to be motivated by what you're going to do and um, and I think, um, yeah, like having, if you're going to have a framework, um, live and breathe that like framework or like the, you know, the, the metrics that you're tracking, don't just do it for the sake of it. Cause it's, it's mm. not worth it. Like you're better off just having nothing. Um, but like, if you're going to do it, um, just do the ones that are really important to you. And yeah, like, um, I think folks will, will love that, um, what you've done there. Yeah. Amazing. And, and anything else from you, Josh? Uh, probably the final piece is to think about becoming, um, this might not be the best term for it, but be a capitalist greenie. So really think about the impact you're creating, but be a capitalist as well. Those two things can happen together. Um, that term's going to grow up the few feelings. I like it. Just, I like it, Josh. Uh, not actually, but um, if you're just a greenie, and I, I don't mean that in a negative way, by the way, but you know, and, and you're still creating impact, then maybe you're not for profit. But if you can say here, no, 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 I'm here to create some personal wealth and change the world or create a family business or anything that says it's got dollar signs on it, mm. it's an investment. So make sure those two go hand in hand. Good investment, good impact, really drive that message home hard. Yeah, amazing. Um, look, thank you both so much. Um, I, I think if there's no other questions, I think we'll give everyone time to go and actually have some lunch. Um, so thank you, um, Jordi. Really, really appreciate your time today. I know that you're very, very busy, but I'm, I know these are also really, really helpful for founders to actually hear the stories from others that have gone through it. And, and thank you, Josh. Um, again, the experience you have across lots of different sort of sectors is always really interesting to introduce to this as well. Um, and thank you, Alison and the Climate Salad team for hosting. Um, really appreciate it. If anyone wants to get in touch with us, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to have a chat about what we do here and if there's any way we can help you. Um, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Thanks everyone. As you head out, there is a survey um, and that's a great opportunity to put in your email if you do want to be in touch with Kylie and the KPMG High Growth Ventures team. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you next time. Bye. Thanks.